Recording in progress, indeed. Well, Borada, good morning, and uh, welcome to our worship again, whether you're joining us on Zoom or YouTube later, and whether you sprang out of bed like a gazelle or you struggled up with a post Wells Euros exit headache. However you are and however you feel this morning, you are very welcome here. We put this time aside together to think and thank, to pray and praise, to be challenged and to be comforted. So let's take a breath. Let's pause for a moment. Let's think about how we are, where we are, how we're sitting, how we're feeling this morning. And remember that God is with us. And I invite you to join in with the words in bold. Come and see. The light of God has come into our world to proclaim God's justice and love. It has overcome the darkness and brought new life. Listen and follow. Christ, our companion, has redeemed our world. He draws us into a loving family from every tribe and family and culture. Get ready to go. The Spirit has equipped us for service, to love our neighbours as we do ourselves, to bring God's salvation to the ends of the earth. Come and see, listen and follow, get ready to go, for all is held in the light of God's love. And we show that now with a symbol of God's love with us as we light a candle. And if you have a candle with you, you might like to light it too. God is with us. So as ever, we are all encouraged to look at the newsletter. Oh, my internet connection is unstable. I hope you can still hear me. I'm looking at Ben. Yeah, okay, all is good. And Simon, thanks. Um, we thank Marcia and uh, for Brian, who are, who are still doing everything that they do up in Trouse, and we hope that they enjoy the last few days up there. Um, there is much in the newsletter this week. Um, so if you're one who means to get round to reading it, but often finds other things to do. I encourage you this week to have a, a, a good read through. It has events that we're invited to, uh, both online and rather excitingly now beginning to be in person. It has, of course, news of those who want to keep in prayer, um, including the family of Caroline Jones, whose funeral it is on Thursday. It has news of friends who are grieving or facing uncertainties or who are in hospital, both near and far. It has good news to celebrate too, which might be needed by some football fans this morning. Um, it includes thanks from Sandra Wallace, who was a, a regular Zoom worshipper with us over the past few months, but whose church is returning to on-site services. So she sends her thanks and it was, it was wonderful that she could join us and I know we'll, we'll be seeing her again at various things. And with Sandra's return, um, it's it's a sign that some things are beginning to, I don't want to use the N word, I'll use a go to a regular pattern. Um, and with that in mind, we, as it says in the newsletter, the elders have been talking about how best to, to enable people to transition to, to feel comfortable to come back to a regular pattern of worship, whilst also acknowledging that this Zoom community is wonderful and uh, I don't have George on my screen right now, but I know George is there from the Cayman Islands. We had Sandra from North Wales. We have people from all over the country, those who might not be able to come into the building for all sorts of reasons. And so we don't want to lose that either. And we know that other members of the church um, are also feeling anxious. Um, the the re-entry to society for many of us is going to be difficult. 
um, and it might be tiring and it might bring out all sorts of stresses. So we took all this in mind and going forward for July to September, um, we're offering the, the following pattern of, of formal worship. We worship God, well, we can worship God while we're doing the washing up, we worship God in our daily living. But for our services, on the first and third Sunday mornings, we will be on site in St. David's Uniting. Uh, Castle Square aren't, aren't going back to the on site just yet. <clears throat> but for the first and third Sunday morning services, we'll be on site and that will be live streamed but it won't have a Zoom service. So that will be live streamed, we hope. Uh, if not, if there are any problems, come back half an hour later and, and it hopefully should be uploaded. Um, but there won't, that won't include a Zoom service. But the second and fourth Sunday mornings will continue to be on Zoom. So every other week, we will gather together in these groups and enjoy our wonderful chat as we do. Um, also, on the first Sunday, this is all in the newsletter, uh, so if you're beginning to switch off, that's okay. You can come back to it. On the first Sunday morning, there'll be a, an on-site uh, short communion service. And on the third su Sunday afternoon, um, there'll be a, a Zoom communion uh, with, with an aspect of sharing stories. More details to come on that. And so thinking about our return, um, Yestin is, is leading our worship in, in uh, on our church premises next week. And I um, looking through and hoping, yes, he's there, and he's going to share with us something that he's inviting us to to get involved with, participate for next Sunday. Yes, Tim. Yes, yeah, thank, thanks, Phil. Morning, everyone. You'll recall last Sunday, Dave Kitchen introduced us to his rewriting of the well-known section from Ecclesiastes chapter 3. There's a time for this and a time for that, etc. Wholly coincidentally, I had considered doing something similar for the service next Sunday. And I mentioned this to Dave when we found ourselves in the breakout room after the service. But with Dave's help and with a great suggestion from Stephen Weber, I'd like to, to invite a community attempt at a contemporary version. I'd invite you then, if you wish, to think of a couplet a time for this or a time for that, whatever, whatever comes to mind, using the experiences of the last 18 months in pandemic as your inspiration. For example, one of my ideas is there's a time for a mask and a time to see the smile. And Stephen's offering, which will definitely make the cut, was there's a time for the mute button and a time to unmute. So I'll expand on this a little bit in the midweek reflection, which I'm also hoping to record. But if you'd send in your ideas in the normal way, I'll put them together in some modern poetry for next Sunday morning service. Thank you, Dioch, back to Phil. Thanks, Justin. Great, so uh, that will, uh, as Justin says, that'll be in the midweek reflection, and then we will be sharing that in the service, those who are, who are there and those uh, who are live streaming next week. That's a lot to take in, it's in the newsletter, but we also wanted a chance to say, you know, for those who aren't ready, for those who might have anxieties, for those who might have to still shield for certain reasons, um, we want to, to remind one another that we, we, we go at our, our, the, the pace we're comfortable at, that God is with us, whether we meet on site or online, whether we're in our homes or on our streets. And with that in mind, Margaret's going to uh, say, lead us in a prayer, after which we will have our, our time of quiet where we review the week. And then I'll bring this time of prayer together with, a, with another oral prayer. So over to Margaret and our prayers. Thank you, Phil. Um, I found this reading online a few days ago and it struck a chord with me. And I expect it'll strike a chord with many others. It's called Sunday Home Bodies by Megan Ruby Wagner. Blessed are the home bodies, those who have not yet figured out how to return to the sanctuaries. For yours is the sanctuary of living room couches and front porch swings. Blessed are the wounded, those who have been broken and rejected on hallowed ground. For yours is the healing that defies the gatekeepers. Blessed are the naturalists who worship in hiking boots, 
those who find God in all her glory, in the dappled light between the trees. For yours is Eden. Blessed are the mothers who spend Sunday like all the others, fetching snacks and being baptised in bodily fluids, for you are the salt of the earth. Blessed are the weary, those who cannot muster the energy to put on their Sunday best, for yours is the comfort of honest existence. Blessed are the patient, who do not rush others' return, for yours is the steady peace that waits and does not panic over lesser numbers. And blessed are the weary, the weary, the wounded, the homeless, both physical and spiritual, the wanderers, the hesitant, the doubters, the skeptics, the outsiders. For yours is the kingdom of heaven, and God will be there when you're ready. Amen. Amen. Let's take some time to think back over the past week in our quiet prayers. Holy risk taker, wonderful God. You create us out of your deep, extravagant love and in great hope. More than this, you make us in your own image. We are amazed and enlivened by your faith in us. And as we look back over the past week, we thank you for your life-giving presence in the delights and in the difficulties we experienced. So we thank you for the moments we encountered your love in a phone call or garden visit, in the beauty of creation or in the quiet of the night. As we strive to discover and rediscover your image in ourselves, we often struggle to be rid of burdens which get in the way. Burdens of guilt, fear, despair. Burdens of anger, resentment, prejudice. Forgive us where we have wrongly burdened others. Help us to forgive those who have wrongly burdened us. Release us from all that harms us. Help us to turn again and again and again from any selfishness to selflessness so that we may grow in wisdom and maturity towards the day when we become the perfect bearers of your image. All of this and more we ask in the name of Jesus, our brother and saviour, who taught us to pray in a multitude of languages and versions, saying, our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sin as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. So we've given God our thanks in our prayers. Let's give God our thanks in praise too. We sing now, now thank we all our God.
Well, as we shared in our notices earlier, we're today wrestling with the question of how best to transition to whatever's coming next in our daily living and in our church life. And with that in mind, we come to the third of our seven searching questions for the church today. You may remember that we've already asked, why do we exist? Possibly to shine with God's love. And what might be lost in our communities if we ceased to exist? Possibly unconditional welcome. And so this morning we reflect on the question, what purposes and principles must we protect as central to our identity? You might also remember that we're pairing up these questions with others from Jesus. And so, sorry, Simon, you might be getting up again. It's to him and the disciples that we now turn as they have their learning put to the test. And Sue or Simon or maybe David, I don't know whom, is going to read for us. Today's reading is from Matthew 13, 16 to 20, and I'm reading from the Good News Bible. Peter's declaration about Jesus. Jesus went to the territory near the town of Caesarea Philippi, where he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? Some say John the Baptist, they answered. Others say Elijah while others say Jeremiah or some other prophet. What about you, he asked them. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Good for you, Simon, son of John, answered Jesus. For this truth did not come to you from any human being but it was given to you directly by my Father in heaven. And so I tell you, Peter, you are the rock. And on this rock foundation, I will build my church. And not even death will ever be able to overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What you prohibit on earth, will be prohibited in heaven. And what you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Then Jesus ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Thanks, Sue. So this week, after spending a fortnight out of the office, Feeling invigorated as I walked along Hadrian's Wall, feeling inspired as I attended the Wales Synod Summer School, and feeling rather old as I led worship with the URC youth exec, I returned to the inevitable avalanche of emails, phone calls and messages, and so did what any wise, dedicated, self-respecting and, can I say handsome, minister would do. I procrastinated. I checked the weather report, I made myself countless cups of tea. I finished the biscuits in my cupboard and in some of the church cupboards. I made lists of things I needed to do rather than get on with much of it. And at one point, I even found myself filling out a form for a volunteer role in Cardiff next year. So to do something with those great swathes of free time that I evidently must have. And as I stepped away from the inbox and filled out this application form, I was faced with several interesting questions. Question one, when and how did you become a Christian? Okay, nothing I haven't answered before. So I trot out a clever little answer about me still becoming a Christian. Nice. And add a bit about baptisms and alpha courses and discipleship. Fine. Question two, what difference does your faith make to your life? Well, again, with me, that's kind of easy. It affects where and how I work how I see the world, other people, myself, how I spend my money, how I vote, how I generally try to live, I might need a bigger box. Question three, who is Jesus to you? Ah, I wrote down perhaps foolishly. Now that's the question I'm asking my congregations this week. Who is Jesus to them? So who is Jesus to you? If you were asked by a friend, neighbour, whoever, 
Who do you say Jesus is? I'm going to pause for a minute. I'm going to time it, don't worry, to let you think of how you might answer that. Feel free to talk with those around you if there are any, or to write it on chat if you want to, or to simply be still and reflect. Who is Jesus to you? That's the minute gone. Now, how would you feel if we stop the sermon now? Don't answer that straight away. If we stop the sermon now and went round square by square, person by person, listening to each answer. Perhaps you might find it easy and interesting. Perhaps you might find it tough and cringeworthy. Perhaps you might even freeze, pretend your internet was down and leave the meeting before you had to answer. Well, however awkward you might feel if we shared our answers in front of each other, just think how on the spot the disciples must have felt when Jesus asked them that very question. Imagine the scene. <clears throat> the disciples have been on the road with Jesus for a while now, and they've seen him do some incredible things. More recently, feeding thousands, stilling storms and healing children. Amazing. He's also been having a bit of a tussle with the Pharisees and teachers of the law, calling them hypocrites and telling them those sideways stories directed at them sometimes. The trouble is, the disciples don't always quite get what Jesus is saying, what he's teaching. And I don't want to be too blasphemic here, partly because that's not even a word, but when I trained as a teacher, I was told that if the pupils don't always understand an exercise, it's perhaps because the teacher hasn't explained it adequately enough. Hmm. Anyway, Jesus clearly didn't get his PGC at King's College. So when the disciples don't get what he is saying, they push Peter forward often to ask Jesus to differentiate the learning a bit. And Jesus replies with an exasperated sigh just earlier. Oh, surely you can't be that dull. Bit harsh. This has literally just happened again when the disciples have been getting confused between literal and metaphorical yeast. When Jesus pushes aside parables and poetry and asks them a direct question. Who do you say the son of man is? For the purposes of finishing the service before nightfall, let's just say the son of man was a title that the disciples knew referred to Jesus. So he was asking them in the more simple version of events that Mark records. Thank you, Mark. Who do people say I am? Okay, so this isn't too tough a question for the disciples, is it? Because it's always easier to answer what other people think rather than answer for yourself. So they go for it. Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. Nice, tick, you've answered it, you've had your turn, phew. But Jesus ain't finished. What about you? He asks them, possibly pausing for dramatic effect. Who do you say I am? And with that, I'm instantly taken back to my GCSE French oral, where I so badly wanted to impress my teacher, but couldn't think of a single French word or phrase other than a desperate, repetez-vous s'il vous plaît? So who do you say I am, asks Jesus. Cue awkward glances 
standal staring and maybe even a first century equivalent of a freeze and leave Zoom exit. And this is where Peter, the one who has just been told off for asking for more clarity, Peter, the bold or perhaps boneheaded, jumps in and answers, you are the Messiah. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Maybe your own answer about Jesus was something like Peter's. Maybe it was wildly different. But surely if we're asked what purposes and principles the church must protect as central to our identity, we might have to start with Jesus and who we say he is. For we could give deep pastoral care and truly love one another. But without Jesus, we'd be a support group. We could arrange great discussions and get involved in important social justice work. But without Jesus, we'd be a bit like a club of like minded individuals. We could fill rotors and host exhibitions. We could obsess about buildings and risk assessments, due process or decline and reduce Jesus to a footnote because it takes so much time, money and energy doing church that we forget to check in, pray with and follow our friend and teacher, the Messiah, the son of the living God. And believe me, I know how easy that can be. So who do we say that Jesus is? How do our beliefs, our actions during the week speak of the man born in first century Palestine? How do our services and service to the communities where we are share the message about a God who came to us, who still comes to us with a message of extravagant love and world changing grace? What do our lives on a Monday morning or Saturday evening, our offerings in print and online, our bank accounts, our friendships, our attitudes to life and death and everything in between, what do they say about the radical who welcomed the outcast and gave hope to the despairing, who was killed by the empire, who rose again in a garden, and who gives his disciples the keys to the kingdom only immediately after telling them that the terms and conditions include life losing and cross carrying. Well, this is sometimes well, a point, a time where I think we can take a leaf out of Peter's book. For Peter would sometimes speak truth and sometimes miss the mark. He could sometimes walk on water and sometimes sink. He could rush in, ruffle feathers, speak before thinking. But from Jesus' call to follow him, to his parting instruction to feed his sheep, Peter took risks, gave his all, got soaked and blessed, rebuked and reborn through the Christ he gave his life to. It was this kind of, of faith upon which Jesus built his church and still does. A faith that doesn't always have to have the right answers, but is willing to give things a go. A faith that can see us step out of the boat and speak up when it's safer to stay quiet. A faith that knows what it is to get things wrong, to need forgiveness and to extend it to others. A faith that is centered upon Jesus, the Messiah, the son of the living God. And as we journey onward to wherever and whatever God's next got in store for us, there will be times when we misstep. There will be times when we don't grasp Jesus' teaching. Times when we might even sink a little before we have to swim. But I think that's okay. I think it's to be expected. I think it's human. Just so long as we stick with Jesus. So long as our focus is on him not merely on our own preferences or comfort or even survival. If our focus is on Jesus, we will be faithful. We will be Christ church and the gates of death will not overcome us. What purposes and principles must we protect as central to our identity? For once, perhaps the answer really and simply is Jesus. Amen. Let's pause for a moment before Vivian will lead us in our prayers of intercession.
not the first time, but the second time and afterwards when I say gracious God, you could say hear our prayer and in your love answer. Gracious God, hear our prayer and in your love answer. Gracious God, in love you created us and in love you sustain us day after day. So it is with confidence that we bring our prayers to you, knowing that you hear us and will respond. We offer our prayers for the world around us. We pray for those who find themselves in bondage, those forced into slavery or prostitution, those oppressed by governments or economic systems those enslaved by personal addictions. Gracious God, hear our prayer and in your love, answer. We pray for those who struggle to raise their children in the midst of violence or poverty, those who can only stand by and watch as their sons or daughters die of starvation or malnutrition, of preventable disease or from gang violence. Gracious God, hear our prayer and in your love, answer. We pray for those who refuse to participate in violence or injustice who courageously stand up for what they know is right, regardless of the personal consequences. Gracious God, hear our prayer, and in your love, answer. We also pray for those who oppress others, who are unable to break free from cycles of violence and anger, who are no longer able to empathize with their victims. Gracious God, hear our prayer and in your love, answer. We pray for all who suffer this day, whether physically, emotionally or spiritually. May your presence surround and sustain each one so that they may know your love and live. Gracious God, hear our prayer and in your love, answer. Finally, God, we pray for ourselves, members of your body here on earth. Help us to keep our eyes focused on Jesus to not be afraid to speak out, take risks, ruffle feathers in his name. Grant us compassion and humility in our relationships. Release the gifts you have given to each one so that in us and through us, your kingdom might come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. And we thank Vivianne for leading our prayers. And of course, uh, some of you may have worked out that I asked Vivianne to lead our prayers as a special birthday treat. What more would someone want than the opportunity to lead our prayers uh, in a service? What more would they want, you ask? I can answer that for us to sing them happy birthday. Yes, we are. So, uh, I'm going to ask in, in, in a second, I'm going to invite you to come off mute. Now, we're, we're not going to go through three whole verses of this because I don't think we should inflict that upon anyone. But uh, as we have done before, what I suggest is we sing the first line in French, then in Welsh, and we'll finish with English. So it will be Joyeux Anniversaire, Pembloeth Happy City, Happy Birthday to Vivian, Happy Birthday to you. Let's give it a go. Uh, I apologize for this, Vivian, but you know, 
<laughs> Happy birthday. So those who are willing, if you're unmuted, French, Welsh, English. Let's go for it. Joyous anniversary, and Ben muted me, I think with good cause. Um, and <laughs> with us back on mute, I think uh, we uh, can go in for another hymn with ourselves on mute. So we sing a hymn that reminds us that the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, our Lord. service is almost at an end. Uh, the Zoomers, we will go into our chat groups in a minute, uh, and YouTubers, um, well, you get to, to hang around till the end of the, to the, end of the blessing. Uh, remember, next week, uh, we will be uh, on site in Kekia West Road in St. David's Uniting Church. It will hopefully be live streamed. Come back later if there's any difficulties with that. But for now, may the Christ who walks on wounded feet walk with all of us on our way. May the Christ who serves with wounded hands stretch out our hands to serve. And may the Christ who loves with a wounded heart open our hearts to love. May we see the face of Christ in everyone we meet. And may everyone we meet see the face of Christ in us. May we go well with God. Amen. <laughs>